with your gift, and I know that you will enjoy it as we sing the hymn of devotion. Today happens to be Kathy Monroe's birthday, too. I've reminded her several times. She's probably sick of hearing it by now, but it's great to have you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Take it from Jonah, verses 1, chapter 1, verses 17 through 2, 10. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, 
and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled, hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me. Seafood, seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains, I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remember you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. May God bless the reading of his word. You know, I don't think that God was taken by surprise when Ruth decided to follow Naomi back to Israel. You know, the scriptures record that in her line, there was not only King David, but also the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Here was a Moabite woman, a Moabite woman who, who married into a, a, an Israelite family who, who at that time had no, no commitment to have to go back to Israel with Naomi. But Ruth chose to make Naomi's people her people, and she became part of the story. I, I don't think that God was taken by surprise when, when Joseph, as a young boy, was sold into slavery by his brothers, the favored son of Jacob, and, and boy, what a time he had. It seemed like every time he started to get back on his feet, whether it was in Potiphar's house or, or later, it seemed like everything seemed to work against him. But I think God knew because God put him in a place later on where he was second to Pharaoh and was able to save the Israelites by bringing them down in the midst of the famine. I, I don't think God was taken by surprise when Saul, the first king, turned against David. <laughs> Saul, handsome and comely, the perfect choice for leadership. A king among kings, and yet his heart turned sour for God. And, but there was David, and, and David became his enemy just because he was good and right. And I don't think it was a surprise to God that that would happen. I don't think God was unaware when Judas decided to betray Jesus. Actually, we read that at the table, at the table of the Lord, Jesus said to Judas, go and do what you got to do and do it quickly. For God knows all things. It's often you and I that question whether God knows, especially in the circumstances of our life. Sometimes things happen to us. We go through challenges and, 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 and disappointments, and we sometimes wonder, does God really know? And then the question that often follows is, if He knows, does He care? And yet we see the examples throughout Scripture of God orchestrating things, moving behind the scenes where things will line up in accordance to His will and His plan. But questioning God isn't something new. It all began in the beginning when, when the devil, the tempter, said, Did God say... That was the question in Genesis 3. It was as if the devil was questioning just what God knew, and, and Eve said, well, maybe he doesn't. And it led to that, that epic thing that we call the fall, where from that day forward, it seemed like many of us questioned what God knew and whether God was even good. That story has been played out over and over again throughout history. And, of course, you and I have played it too when reflecting on the way that certain things happened. I know I've been known to say, now if I was God, I have dot, 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 I'd have done things differently. But then again, I'm not. Because I don't have the knowledge, the foresight, the understanding that God does. We, we want to second-guess God. The problem is that we don't know what He knows. 
Earlier this year, we spoke about God's omniscience in one of our messages. God's vantage point is much greater than ours because He sees things from above in an eternal perspective. You might say that He sees the big picture while we often only see what we see. That was certainly the case in the story of Jonah, wasn't it? God asked Jonah to go and to call on the Assyrians to repent. He told him to share the word, if you repent and worship me, I will spare you. And Jonah didn't like it. He couldn't see the point in it. So he ran in the other direction. I can hear him thinking, doesn't God know how wicked these people are? Well, God knows. The truth is that Jonah's story is just as relevant today as it was then. God has a heart for creation. And all of us who live here. Just because we've gone astray doesn't mean that he's given up on us. That's the good news of the gospel that we share. The problem is that we like it when it applies to our own salvation, but not so much when it has to do with those we don't like. The Assyrians were a wicked people, and their capital city, Nineveh, was the heart of debauchery. They had brutalized the Israelites and were relentless in their attacks on them and other nations. The good people of Israel, like Jonah, would have been praying for God to destroy them and leave them in ashes. But you see, this God we speak of in the Old Testament is the same God who sent His only begotten Son into the world to save the world. Jesus didn't come just to save people like you and me who deserve it. Well, wait a minute. We'll get back to that in a minute. He came to save the entire world. The truth is that there will come a judgment day, but until that time, God is still at work. He sees things in people's hearts that we don't see, because God knows each heart. When Jonah rejected God's call, he found himself running in the opposite direction, trying to get as far away from Nineveh as possible. He gets on a boat, and when a storm comes, he gets tossed overboard. Wouldn't you know it? He gets swallowed by a big fish. We could say a whale. Jonah must have done a lot of thinking in those three days. We get a little bit of his prayer as he's inside the belly of the whale. For when he came out, he returned to God and then he proceeded to Nineveh to follow that original call. He preached to the people he hated and that he had hoped would die. And an amazing thing happened. When the Assyrian king and all the people heard the word of God, these hated vicious, evil people, they repented. They worshiped God and everything changed. For you see, God knew what would happen when they would hear the word. And very often that's what happens in the lives of many of us. Maybe that's what led you here. Someone shared the gospel with you, the good news, and when you heard it, you began to think about it and take it in and it began to make an impression on you and a transformation began to happen. Maybe it happened as a little child. Some of the children watching at home maybe say, I love Jesus. Maybe it happened later in life, but when you hear the gospel, the good news, it changes you. I think the problem with many of us is that too often when troubles have come calling, we want vengeance. We want justice, and we want to see it the way we want to see it. We want to see those who hurt us suffer, but that's not what God wants. God wants to see hearts turned. God wants to see lives changed. God wants to see people saved. God looks forward to a day, the Bible tells us, when every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's His goal, not to cast everybody away. John 3.17, we often quote John 3.16, for God so loved the world. But John 3.17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to, to, to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. And you see, that was already happening in Jonah's day. When the gospel was preached, the good news was preached, it worked. The text tells us in chapter 3, When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. 
This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh, that terrible city with those terrible people. He said, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn from his anger so that we will not perish. Now, you would think that that would be a cause for cries of rejoicing and that Jonah would be at the head of the line. You know, one one of the theologians says that of all the prophets in the Old Testament, Jonah is the most successful because many other prophets spoke even to Israelite kings and they were ignored. But Jonah spoke and a wicked nation changed their hearts. And here's Jonah who got angry And he pouted, and he says, in effect, I knew this was going to happen because you're a God of compassion. We need to listen to those words. We're talking about the persecuted church today. Jonathan aptly reminded us that not only do we need to pray for those persecuted churches, the persecuted Christians who are living in hell, in the nations where God planted them, But we need to pray for those persecutors as well, those governments, those leaders, those individuals. And we need to pray that their hearts may be changed. Jonah gives us an important reminder that it's not all about us. (laughs) You know, sometimes we think, you know, that that we're the center of... I used to think as a kid growing up that I was in a movie and I was a star. And that everybody else was just, you know, uh, what, what do they call them? So best supporting actors and actresses, you know. And sometimes we live our lives that way, thinking as if we're the only important person in the world. And let me tell you this, to God, you are. But God looks at each and every one of His creatures as being special. God wants every heart turned That's why he calls you and I to be his ambassadors, his witnesses, his hands and feet in the world. That's why we're called to pray for our brothers and sisters. We're called to pray for the persecuted and the persecutors, that their hearts might be turned. You know, this was Dr. Martin Luther King's prayer. He didn't call for the oppressors to be destroyed. I know some of his contemporaries were were hoping and praying that those who had oppressed them would find themselves in heaps and ashes. But, but, but he prayed that they might be changed, those who oppressed his people. He wanted to see the same thing happening to them that happened in Nineveh. For he knew that one day they'd have to live together in peace and harmony. And that day hasn't come yet, but we want to continue that prayer. That all people might continue to be able to walk together You know, now God knows the best way to overcome your adversaries is to conquer them with love. After all, that's what happened to you and me. We didn't come to faith because we were beaten or whipped or tortured. We came because, and I'll almost guarantee it, because someone prayed for us and then loved us. I tell my story that a little three or four year old boy in a church, a Sunday school teacher, sat me on her knee. Now she probably said a lot of things, but the words I remember was, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. And I like to think that, that that Sunday school teacher maybe didn't know what my life would be like in those next few years as my parents suffered with alcoholism and ended up in divorce and, and we were kind of devoid of any kind of religion for a number of years. But it was that sense that God knew and God was with me that probably saved my life. Because you see, even though we don't know, God knows We didn't come to faith because of somebody threatening us. We came because someone loved us. And maybe there's a message in that. The truth is that God could have forsaken all of us. The Apostle Paul says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 makes it clear that sin is a real stumbling block. And that when we stand before God, none of us, none of us can stand His righteousness. Sin hardens our hearts. It makes us often selfish and cruel. 
corrupts our ability to love ourselves and one another. Sin also keeps us from God. Yet God looks past our sin, the scriptures tell us time and again, and He sees what we can become. He looks into our hearts and He saw how they became hardened maybe by the world and made us into the person that we were or are. I love that Psalm 139 for so many reasons. But David, David who, who knew God, who had, who, who had struggled with, with what was going on in his life and the battles he had, says that God was always with him. And in that beautiful prayer, he talks about the fact that there's not a place we can go where God doesn't know, where He isn't with us, where He doesn't see us, where He doesn't know what we're saying or speaking, even before we speak it. God knows what you and I have been through. He, he knows what you're going through now. There are some who are struggling, maybe with relationships, maybe mourning the loss of someone close to them. Maybe, maybe it's something else. Maybe you're, you're, you're just struggling with who you are and what you've done. Years ago, I had a man who, who had been one of the er, first people that went to Vietnam. And he came to me and he said, he said, Cal, if you knew what I had done, you would know that God can never forgive me. It broke my heart because I believe that God can forgive anything if we go to Him because God knows us. God looks past our sin and sees what we can become. He knows that we're products of our environment and that sometimes we get so caught up in the weeds that we can't help ourselves. And that's why He never gave up on us. In ancient times, He sent prophets like Jonah to speak. And then He sent His son Jesus to take the punishment and to carry our sins into the grave with Him so that we could be made justified with God and right with God. We read in Romans 3.24 the continuation of that verse I just read and it says, all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. It's because God knows what we need that you and I have become the Jonas of our generation. The world we live in is bitterly divided. And we're sent out to bring people together in Christ's name. We're to preach to them, to testify to God's amazing power and proclaim the name of Jesus even to people who, who others and maybe we ourselves think are unworthy. I, I love, years ago when I was in Norwich, we, we began to have outdoor services down in the park. And, and we joined together with our sister church, the Norwich Worship Center. And some of you have heard this story. And and we put together a worship service. They were Pentecostal. They were very free-flowing and outgoing. And, and I think I was the preacher that day, and they did the music, and it was, it was quite a service. And, and down in Howard Brown Park, there were a number of people who uh, were the street people. They were homeless. Uh, many of them would come, and as we would meet week after week, some of them would be drunk. And I'll never forget, we were meeting with North Worship Center, which I called a first-line church. They were out there with those people who maybe had never heard the name of Christ or never done anything. And, and that day when I was preaching, I, I saw a group of them, two or three, go over to this one man who was inebriated, who was making all kinds of rude comments, and they went and sat with him. Not to shut him up or to stop him, but to just sit and be with him. And then after the service, they spoke with him, and they got him something to eat. And, and I found out that in the week ahead, they not only took him back to their church, but they found him some new clothes, and they found him a place to stay. A lot of people would have written that man off. They would have said, oh, he's just an interruption, he's rude. But they were able to see what God saw in him. Maybe someone saw that in you. And maybe that's part of your testimony, which would give hope to someone else. You see, we're called to preach to the oppressors. We're called to preach to the downcast. We're called to share the gospel with those who are feeling lost. We're called to speak the name of Jesus to those who will not believe. That's our calling. We're called to be Jonas in this day. So don't run like Jonah did. I don't know if you'll get swallowed up by a whale, but something's going to happen when you run from the call of God. Embrace that call. Make it a part of your everyday life. You see, Jesus said the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. That was you and I at one point. And now He's given that mission to us. Do you remember the movie Titanic? 
where the orchestra is brought out on deck. I, I knew that Kathy was going to be playing, and it just called to mind the, the last beautiful music. They, they brought all the musicians out on the deck, and as the si- ship is going down, they're trying to make everything as normal as possible, and the beautiful music is there. And in, in, the, in the hall below, they're, they're feeding hors d'oeuvres and food, and yet the ship is going down. People are eating and drinking and dancing. Well, others were scurrying around to get the lifeboats ready, a few of them thinking of others. That's the image that I want you to hold on to today as we think about the world around us. It's wonderful to be in the orchestra, to be a server, but we've been given the lifeboat, and his name is Jesus. We have the lifeboat, and our calling is to get as many people in as possible. And so I give you that charge today. As you go through this next week, look around you and see those who are hurting, those who are struggling, and offer them a kind word and then say a prayer for them. If they'll allow you to, and I know this is being bold, but if they'll allow you to, if you feel the Spirit nudging you, say, can I say a prayer for you? I just get this sense and speak to them. And as you do, you just might save an eternity for someone. God bless you this day as we gather and hear his word. Amen.